we are ready for the second session, which is uh, society-centered uh, computational mathematics. Um, I'm, I'm, uh, it's a pleasure for me to introduce the moderator for the session. Uh, it's Dr. Ashwin Rao. Um, Ashwin is the uh, vice president of AI at Target and has been an adjunct faculty in ICME for a few years now. He's also the lead of the uh, our mathematics and computational finance um, master's program. Uh, together with uh, with uh, faculty mathematics and in uh, uh, NSME here at Stanford, um, be, and uh, is also actually involved in teaching at Stanford a class of reinforcement learning for uh, for finance. Uh, before Target, he was at Goldman Sachs and also um, um, the director of market modeling at uh, Morgan Stanley. And uh, it's a real pleasure to to introduce him and to start this second session. Ashwin, over to you. Thank you, Gianluca. Let me start the session. Let me start by providing a bit of perspective of what this session is about. So, for the past several decades, mathematicians and engineers have developed useful technologies for society that make it easy for us to interact with each other, to travel from one place to another, to earn our livelihoods, and enjoy our community life. As computational math has become more and more sophisticated, we've been able to provide valuable products and services with great conveniences and efficiencies at affordable prices. So one would think we are getting happier as a society, but we are actually finding that these conveniences and efficiencies are not quite translating to personal satisfaction or societal harmony. There is now a greater need than ever to target our work in computational math to the heart of what society is all about, less about convenience and financials and more about being in harmony with the people and environment around us. Here at Stanford, many of us think about this a lot. When we start working on our math models and algorithms, we ask ourselves if the solution to this problem would be appropriate for society. And more importantly, if there are some details in our algorithm that could lead to undesirable outcomes. When you receive a recommendation to buy something or to connect with someone, I'm sure many of you have been left wondering if the algorithm knows something about you that you wouldn't want it to know. I'm sure many of you don't like it when an algorithm seems to have stereotyped you in a manner that you're not comfortable with. We have to improve our algorithms to overcome biases to infer without certain types of sensitive data, to be robust, to noise your incomplete data, and to permit fair participation to people of all backgrounds. On a personal note, as a father of two teenagers, I constantly worry about how future generations will increasingly live in a world of electronic devices and perhaps not be able to sufficiently engage in physical researchers in applied math, we obviously don't have the solutions to all these complex societal issues, but we are eager to do our bit for society with appropriate methods from computational math. As a simple example, think about algorithms that would encourage physical interactions over electronic interactions. More generally, think about algorithms that will provide conveniences and efficiencies without sacrificing privacy or safety. At Stanford, we perform a wide variety of research in this space. So today, it's my pleasure to moderate this session where we will share a sample of research topics pertaining to AI for society presented by a panel of four of our researchers. Our first speaker is Ashish Goel, Professor of Management Science and Engineering. Ashish's research is in design analysis, and applications of algorithms. In particular, Ashish is passionate about developing algorithms that improve how we interact with each other. Today, he will talk about his exciting work on enabling decision-making at scale by developing a video conferencing platform for civic deliberation. Over to you, Ashish. So this talk is about decision-making at scale, and uh, normally, we are very good at making simple decisions, or at least structurally, we're good at making simple decisions. An example of a simple decision would be, should we elect Trump or Clinton? 
and those kinds of decisions are easy to make. Uh, you just go and vote, and whoever gets the most votes uh, often wins. But in this class, uh, but in this talk, you're going to think of more complex decisions. So, for example, uh, imagine that you want to make a decision about how to reopen the economy after the COVID crisis. And if you have that conversation on Twitter, on WhatsApp, you'll, you'll see that conversation very quickly devolve into sort of name calling and vitriol. And the focus of our group has been to develop the algorithms, the theory, the platforms, and also deploy these platforms, which will help us make complex decisions at large scale. So today, I'll uh, primarily focus on one kind of decision, one that we call uh, participatory budgeting. It's a process emphasizing the role of citizen involvement uh, in political decision making. And the idea here is that the city takes a small amount of its budget and it keeps it aside for direct vote by the public. And many cities in the US do it. Uh, we have a platform which facilitates uh, participatory budgeting. Uh, it's open source and free. We're looking for collaborations. It's been used in over 70 elections uh, in the US, uh, in North America so far. We have many voting methods, many languages, authentication methods, such visualizations. So this is uh, what the platform looks like. So this is the platform as it was used in Chicago in the 49th Ward. Uh, as you can see that you can go and select uh, whatever amount of money you want to spend. And you can immediately see that uh, change on a map uh, in terms of which trees are going to get repaved. You can also go and choose a certain number of projects. So for example, you can say, I, I, want, I want these four projects to get uh, funded. As soon as you see this uh, interface, uh, it's clear that this interface is not quite matched well to the budgeting problem. Because as I'm choosing these projects, I'm not really paying much attention to how much they cost. <laughs> to avoid that situation, uh, we have another interface that we call uh, knapsack voting. And the idea here is that you have something which is very much like a knapsack. So imagine you have a knapsack which has a capacity of a of $100,000 because that's the total budget you have. And you're putting projects into this knapsack. And as a result, your knapsack is filling up. You can see a progress bar at the top which shows you whether the knapsack, uh, how much money you have left. And you can play around with the budget till you run out of money. So this seems like a fairly simple change and it's not clear uh, that this requires uh, a lot of thinking, but in reality, this actually gives you very strong properties. So what we can show is that NAPSAC voting leads to a final solution that maximizes agreement with the voting population. This is something that we can formally show. We show that it's incentive compatible, assuming voters utility is what we call the overlap utility, which is basically, I have an ideal budget. If someone else proposes another budget, then my, util, my cost or my penalty is just the distance between the two budgets as points in high dimensional spaces. And incentive compatibility is something that's very hard to achieve in elections of this type. So it's incredible that such a simple algorithm, or such a simple switch in the voting method leads to incentive compatibility. Uh, this platform has been widely adopted. It was slow, but now a lot of cities do knapsack voting. And in addition to solving an important problem for cities and states, which is participatory budgeting, how do we get citizen involvement in uh, spending uh, the budget that we have? This is uh, all. This also leads to some very interesting and exciting directions. So, for example, as we do participatory budgeting, and because our platform is online, we led to this problem of how do we advertise for diversity? How do we recruit a diverse population online? Okay. Now, as it turns out, platforms such as Facebook and Google provide very little support. They'll allow you to target in all kinds of different ways, but there's no way currently you can go to Facebook or go to Google and say, "Give me a diverse sample." of uh, all the citizens of Durham or Greensboro or Palo Alto or Chicago. Yeah. Now, without explicitly addressing diversity, these online processes are not very representative. So what happens is uh, uh, voting in these kinds of elections tends to be uh, richer, whiter, and more female. And if you, if you do them online, it gets even richer, whiter, and more female. So you have to do something to address diversity, especially in civic processes like participatory budgeting, but there's no support for doing it. And this is one of those problems which is, which sort of clearly identifies uh, um, an interface uh, between say, what AI can do and what the societal objectives are. So all these advertising platforms have a lot of AI algorithms built in, 
which they're using for targeting, relevance, estimation, pricing of these ads. And uh, is, these algorithms are sufficiently complex and very opaque. So one of our approaches is to find the right interface between what a platform can do and what a platform can guarantee, what the interface should look like and what an advertiser should do. We've used this approach uh, successfully in Greensboro and Durham, where uh, we have run, run multiple campaigns targeted at different demographics and like a multi-armed bandit, we allocate money to these different campaigns to achieve diversity. So this is one example of sort of how uh, uh, you can interact with AI-based systems without un understanding them completely because they're opaque, but still achieve your end goals. The other direction that emerges is that uh, participatory budgeting is, is still like a voting process. It's still an individual process. What's missing currently from our discourse are good deliberative tools. How do I talk to other people? How do I convince them? How do I get convinced by them? And for that purpose, we have uh, developed what we call the automated moderator, which is a video conferencing system for civic deliberation. So the idea is you log onto the system, you are assigned to a group, there's a fixed agenda. And this conversation, this conversation is uh, free flowing, but, but there's a moderator in the room and the moderator is not a human being, but a bot. And this moderator keeps the conversation civil. Thank you. So everyone gets a chance to speak. It keeps it on topic. If the conversation stays away from the agenda, it flags it. Uh, this is in collaboration with the Center for Deliberative Democracy, in particular, Jim Fishkin, who's an expert in deliberation. And uh, again, this is uh, a mix of uh, human elements and machine learning. We use a mix of machine learning APIs. For example, we use uh, a machine learning API for doing transcription, for doing agenda management. Uh, we use another one for, uh, for uh, policing offensive speech. But we also do group policing. Like I can report somebody else. I can nudge someone else if they're not speaking enough and I want to hear from them. So again, it's a combination of human elements and uh, machine learning elements. Um, Thank you very much. I'm sorry for the glitch at the beginning. I think that's all I have to say. Thank you, Ashish. That was fantastic. Our next speaker is Alison Konek, PhD student at Stanford ICME. Alison's research is broadly in the intersection of economics and computer science and focuses on fairness in machine learning and causal inference in public health space. Today, she will talk about racial disparities in automated speech recognition. Over to you, Allison. Great, thanks for the intro. Can everyone hear me? Yes. All right, great. Um, I'll be talking about racial disparities in automated speech recognition. Now, this is joint work with Stanford and Georgetown linguists and computer scientists. Um, so the first question is, what is automated speech recognition? We'll be referring to this as ASR throughout the presentation. Um, now, you're likely to encounter these technologies in your home or pocket via products like Alexa or Google's voice assistant. And what we did was we studied speech to text systems similar to these and found that the systems performed twice as poorly for black speakers as for white speakers. Uh, and in fact, this result held true across all five firms that we examined, which are Amazon, Apple, Google, IBM, and Microsoft. But why does it matter if the stakes are just like Siri doesn't understand when you ask it to play a certain song? Um, concretely, ASR systems have far-reaching effects, um, and so some examples going clockwise, clockwise from the top left. Um, the disabled often don't have control of their hands or uh, may be hard of hearing, so they would need to take phone calls using these speech-to-text systems. Uh, cars are incorporating ASR systems for navigation. Doctors use dictation services that are specifically trained on medical terminology to record patient notes. Um, and court reporters are sometimes assisted by ASRs to transcribe court hearings. So you can imagine that uh, there are big consequences if the ASR technology is biased, um, because what are the impacts downstream if, for example, courtroom transcriptions are only accurate for white defendants, but not black defendants. Um, it's worth noting also that these types of racial concerns are not limited to ASR systems, but are prevalent throughout other machine learning systems, um, such as facial recognition. So let's start by discussing the audio data that we used to test various ASR systems. Um, historically, ASR research has used predominantly white speakers to train speech-to-text models. In order to audit the current ASR systems, we want to find roughly matched voice clips of both white and black speakers that are not already used by the companies that we audit. So we found two sets of interviews with newly or unreleased data, uh, which are Coral, which contains interviews of black Americans, um, and VOC, which contains interviews of white Americans. Now, to run our analyses, we restrict our sample utterances to interviewees in each of these two data sets, 
where the interviewee's speech is split into voice clips by natural pauses in conversation, all of which last fewer than 50 seconds. Now, critically, each of our data sets come with transcriptions generated by linguists. So we use these human generated transcripts as our ground truth and compare the ASR system's speech to text transcriptions to the ground truth that we have for each of Coral and VOC. Um, so to, to make this a bit more concrete, recall that our overarching goal is to compare ASR performance on black speech to white speech. So we propensity match black and white voice snippets um, by age, gender, and voice clip duration. And then for each sample, we feed the audio into one of the ASR systems, each of which generates a speech to text transcription, um, which we then compare to the ground truth transcription, which is human generated. So for example, we compare the Apple transcription of a black audio clip to the corresponding choral transcription and so on. Um, but how do we actually measure if this comparison is like a good transcription or a bad transcription? Um, the metric that we use is called the word error rate for which the numerator is the edit distance between the ASR generated transcript and the grand truth. And the denominator is the number of words in the grand truth phrase. So for example, to go from that is a presentation to the grand truth of what a great presentation. We have to substitute that for what, and then delete is, and then insert great. So this means three changes out of a four word phrase, which is a really bad 75% word error rate. Now for context, a word error rate of about 50% is like not understandable. So let's listen to a few audio clips to get a sense of um, different word error rates. Well, when I was, I was really young, um, I'd had a book of basketball statistics and I would spend a lot of time a lot of time reading them. Um, and for some reason, I forget why now, but Jason Kidd ended up being my favorite player. So among the ASRs we measured, white men had an average word error rate of around 20%. So that was a white man's voice clip with a representative word error rate. Meanwhile, among the ASRs we measured, black men had an average word error rate of around 40%, which is double that of white men. Um, so here again is a representative voice clip in that word error rate range. I mean, I, I know I was kind of tall for uh, high school. I didn't, I didn't want to play center. I didn't because center don't have the ball that much. You get the ball occasionally when you want to post. I mean, but I didn't want to play it. So as you can see, the differences in word error rates are pronounced by race, and that's true for both men and for women. These racial disparities are also consistent across all five firms that we looked at. Apple, IBM, Google, Microsoft, um, and, Apple, and Amazon. So you might ask, what are some of the underlying causes for the differences in word error rate? Um, one feature that we found to be highly correlated with word error rate is the density of the variety of English known as African-American vernacular English, which we refer to as AV. Um, now, AV is spoken by a majority of Black Americans nationwide. And in our sample, we hand-coded the number of AV linguistic features occurring within a voice clip. So for example, speech with copula absence means that the standard English grammatical phrasing would be, they are gone, whereas the AV equivalent would be, they gone without the R. So let's listen to some examples contrasting the different ab features highlighted in blue in the following slides. Grow older, we get darker. So I was extremely light when I was a child and very skinny. And um, so I was like an outcast because I was made fun of because I was the white girl at the school. So this example had only one ab feature, uh, which was syllable initial fricative stopping, um, the B here, and also a low word error rate. Next, let's listen to an example with many ab features and a high word error rate. Well, my seventh grade teacher gave me a nickname Snake because she said I was sneaky. You know, mm -hmm. I'd be sitting one place and she turned around, I'm sitting someplace else. All right. So when we compare samples across location, we find a strong correlation of dialect density. So this is the DDM measure um, against ab minus against ab features um, against the word error rates calculated by ASRs. So specifically what this shows is that ASRs perform worse on uh, voice snippets that invoke a stronger AV accent. Um, so lastly, why do ASRs perform poorly on AV speech? There are two underlying components to modern ASR models. So the first is language models, which measure what you say. So that's like predicting models of lexicon and grammar. An example of this is GPT-2. And secondly, acoustic models measure how you say what you say. So that's things like phonology, phonetics, or prosody. Um, we found through a series of tests that language models themselves do not yield the racial disparity we see in word error rates, but the acoustic models do recreate the same magnitude of word error rate. And I can go into that more in detail in the Q&A. Um, but in summary, 
all five ASR systems uh, had word errors that were twice as bad for black speakers as for white speakers. And we believe that these disparities arise from the underlying acoustic model, um, which does not understand AV features, likely due to a lack of training on diverse speech data. And so we'll end with a call to action. We hope that more resources are directed towards collecting more diverse training data um, for AV speech and for other non-standard varieties of English. Thanks. Thank you, Allison. That was fantastic. Our next speaker is Alan Goose, faculty in ICME. Alan is an applied mathematician working in the fields of statistics, networking, and cryptography. Today, Alan will talk about the importance of privacy when it comes to AI and big data. He will provide some unique perspectives on why privacy matters and talk about some of his work on tools and methods that will deliver value, but with more privacy. Over to you, Alan. Thank you, Ashwin. Uh, so yeah, the title of this talk is uh, What's the Use of Privacy? It's a rather large topic to cover in just a few minutes. I'm gonna talk about a research area I've been involved in where privacy requirements are useful in unexpected ways rather than just imposing restrictions on what kind of data analysis you can do. So uh, when you do data analysis that uses private personal data like health data or behavioral data, um, privacy is often, it's like a constraint and an optimization problem. You have to uh, respect the privacy constraint while you maximize the quality of the analysis. But in some industrial applications, uh, things can be viewed a bit differently. Um, sometimes you want to solve some, if you can solve some privacy engineering problems, you can get not just a better data analysis, but whole new markets and businesses can suddenly become possible. Um, and I'll give an example. So there's an analogy here with probably the most important privacy enhancing technology of all time, which is end-to-end -end encryption across communication channels. Um, this enabled financial transactions on the internet and internet commerce completely transformed pretty much what everything about how we do business today. Um, <clears throat> the specific example I want to use here is the collection of location data, which is done by GPS tracking on uh, mobile phones. There are all sorts of, I would say, illegitimate applications, uh, which involve targeting of individuals for advertising, other kinds of surveillance and manipulation. <clears throat> but one uh, decent application that many businesses are interested in is uh, modeling aggregated movements of people across an urban area. So if you can track individual GPS locations, you can find very useful patterns, like uh, do people that go to this particular cafe tend to go to this gym or to that gym? I mean, this is pre and, and post COVID, I guess. Um, what stores do Stanford students frequent versus Foothills College students? And Business consultants, for example, really love this kind of data. There's all sorts of strategic planning that can come out of these kind of analytics. But the question is, is there a technology that allows us to get these reports, which are aggregate reports, without revealing anything about the individual data that's gone into it? And importantly, not even revealing it to the people doing the analysis themselves. And it's important to realize that it's not just enough to anonymize the identities of the people you're tracking. Um, for example, it's well known that 85% of the population of the US can be identified if you know just their gender, their date of birth, and their zip code. They can be identified exactly. And it's trivial to identify someone whose movements you have tracked minute by minute for a day or so. Um, it turns out that there is a huge gray market in location data, and there are many apps which serve one purpose, like gas station pricing or tracking family and friends, something like that, that have SDKs built in that upload tracking data so the data can be sold uh, through data brokers to analytics companies. Um, while I say it's a gray market, uh, it's not strictly illegal. Uh, GDPR, the European privacy laws, and California privacy laws are pretty vague on how to treat anonymized data. Uh, companies I know in the space get advice from lawyers that what they're doing is legal because they're not collecting direct personal information like names and addresses and so on, even though these could be reconstructed easily from the data that they do collect. Uh, but there's definitely something seedy about it. Uh, companies don't want people to know that they use these apps to collect this data. Lots more companies will probably collect the data and make use of the analytics in 
useful ways if there was a, a guaranteed way of keeping individual data private. Um, of course, there are also the big internet companies that do exactly the same thing, but keep it all in-house, the data collection, the analysis, and the publishing. But interestingly, of the two worlds, so the gray market of data brokers versus the large companies that do it all in-house, I would argue that the best place to start to solve the privacy violation problems in location tracking is with the gray market. And there are two reasons for this. Uh, one is that interchange of data between organizations rather than within a single organization uh, needs public APIs and protocols. And that is extremely healthy for encouraging good behavior. As they say, sunlight is the best disinfectant. Um, I've personally seen this dynamic happening again and again where app developers intend to keep users' data private, but end up you know, sucking up all the data they possibly can from users' phones for debugging purposes, just in case and just for the time being, and then this kind of behavior becomes permanent. And there's just not enough motivation within a closed organization uh, to be disciplined about these sorts of lapses. Um, the other reason is that there, uh, with multiple organizations participating through public APIs, you can actually solve the privacy problem completely. Uh, it is possible to remove all knowledge of individual location data from all stages of the collection and analysis process. And this is done with the so-called zero trust technologies. So zero trust is an overhyped term at the moment, but to say that a component of a security system is zero trust, essentially means not that you don't trust it, but that you don't need to trust it, uh, because essentially it doesn't know enough to be dangerous. Um, for example, if it collects data, then the data is encrypted um, and some other component knows the key. If it's doing analytics, uh, say counting location visits, uh, then it doesn't have enough context to tie these visits to any single individual. And the idea is that uh, every organization in this gray market should participate Minute. as a zero trust component. So I can't go into technical detail. It turns out that there are solutions that use just two zero trust components, which should be separate organizations. And these uh, solutions use some interesting new cryptography. Uh, for example, there's a new primitive we have used that combines homomorphic encryption uh, and hashing into a single uh, uh, unit. Um, I guess the point I'd really want to emphasize is that using these sort of approaches, it should be possible to create a legitimate and provably secure market for this aggregate location analytics. And then very importantly, I would say this can provide some encouragement for the bigger internet data companies uh, to follow suit. And I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alan, that was fantastic. Our next speaker is Peter Glynn. Thomas Ford Professor of Management Science and Engineering. Peter's research interests are in simulations, computational probability, and stochastic systems. I've had the pleasure of working with Peter over the past few years on forecasting and stochastic optimization techniques relevant to a retail business at Target. Today, Peter will talk about his recent work on developing tools to support decision-making at the Stanford Hospital, accounting for the fact that data on coronavirus cases has been of poor quality. Over to you, Peter. Uh, thanks very much, Ashwin. Um, it's a pleasure to be here this morning. So you can see on the title, this is analytics when the data quality is bad. There's probably no better example of a bad data quality environment than what we've been dealing with with the coronavirus. So let me first of all give you some context for what you're gonna see in the next few slides. So uh, several of my students and I have been working with the Children's Hospital for several years on various operations issues. So in this context, operations doesn't mean the, the operating room per se. This is really referring to how to better utilize the hospital's existing resources to get better throughput through the hospital and to get better quality for the patients. In early March, it became evident that we had an emerging public health emergency in our area in Santa Clara County. And our group decided that we should try to respond to that. And I'm gonna be telling you a bit in the next few slides about what our group did 
to help support the Stanford Hospital's leadership in making some of the early decisions with regard to how to deal with the coronavirus. And you'll see that uh, the tools that our group developed are tools that were really predicated on uh, the fact that a lot of the data was quite bad. At the bottom of this slide, you can see the people that uh, were in this group. One of the um, members on the first line is a faculty member, colleague of mine, Jose Blanchet. The two others in the first line are from the Stanford Hospitals. And the others uh, in the second line are all students. And they did an absolutely amazing job of rolling out these tools in a very short amount of time under a lot of pressure. So uh, let me uh, now tell you about um, the situation on March the 13th. Uh, the coronavirus was declared a national emergency on March the 13th. And you can see that in early March, the number of confirmed cases in Santa Clara County was increasing potentially exponentially. So there was a lot of concern about uh, just what we were facing in the local area. And um, the Stanford uh, hospital leadership recognized that uh, the hospitals needed to respond to this potential coronavirus emergency. And in particular, maybe the very first big question that they needed to address was when to stop elective surgeries. For every elective surgery coming to the hospital, it's not only an operating room that has to be allocated, but then there's the post-operative care. And that could take up a bed for a significant period of time that might potentially be needed by a coronavirus patient. So it was a big question about when to stop elective surgeries. There were questions about uh, how much additional staffing would be needed in the next weeks as they're developing staffing plans for the month of March. There were questions even about whether surge facilities would be needed. Thankfully, Stanford never needed to do this, but there were questions about at what point would tents be needed to house uh, coronavirus patients Would potentially the Stanford undergraduate residences potentially uh, be needed in order to handle some of the surge. Again, that was never, uh, we never needed to, to go down that path, but uh, that possibility existed as a potential issue uh, in early March. And then as probably many of you know, there were significant questions about how to extend the inventory of personal protective equipment, things like N95 masks and so forth. How could we stretch out the existing inventory in a way that would maintain the safety of the uh, medical personnel in the hospitals. So the, the quality of the data that we had at this point it was really very bad. It still, even today, is not particularly good. But as of early March, there had been almost no testing in the US population, in particular in California, only roughly 1,000 tests done on a population of 40 million people. You can see on the right hand side of this slide, the very stringent criteria that California was using at that time to basically ration the tests. Uh, you had to, had, to, had to have significant coronavirus symptoms and you had to pass uh, several other criteria that are listed on the right hand side of the slide. So it was a very high bar that you had to pass through to get a test at that time. So as a consequence, there was enormous selection bias present in the way testing was being done. And as a consequence, one had no real sense of the prevalence of the virus in the general population. And of course, that would have an enormous impact on how fast the number of cases would double the so-called doubling time. There was also a lack of scientific understanding. Again, this is something that is still present today. Uh, there was a lack of understanding of how long the infectious period lasted. Uh, even today, uh, not much understanding of exactly what the impact of various social distancing measures is on the rate at which new infections develop. Uh, by the way, the uh, Santa Clara County uh, put in place uh, shelter in place provisions, I think on March the 17th. So uh, as of early March, uh, Santa Clara County had not yet put in place these sorts of social distancing provisions that uh, became uh, commonplace uh, later in the month. And then there uh, also were questions about the degree of and the duration of immunity for recovered individuals. Again, even today, a lot of uncertainty about uh, that issue. So in this context, uh, we took the view that the role of analytics here was to try to provide the hospital leadership with a decision tool that would help assist them in making uh, various decisions and helping them understand the various scenarios that might be present relative to the key uncertainties. The biggest 
uncertainty by far being the doubling time of the number of infected individuals in Santa Clara County uh, over the weeks and months to come. So there was an enormous amount of uncertainty present. Uh, as a consequence, uh, our model building philosophy was A, we wanted to get a tool built quickly, but we also wanted a tool that was easy to use by senior, by senior leadership, very transparent, uh, focused on scenario analysis and the like. So what we built were uh, various models that uh, to, to help support various decisions that the hospital needed to make. Here's an R shiny dashboard that you can see. The key input at the very upper left-hand uh, part of the slide is the doubling time. And this is something that the hospital leadership used to uh, help understand exactly how many cases you'd have in the ICU, the intensive care units, and the acute care units at Stanford. Those are graphed out to the right. And we also built a model for PPE usage that was used within the hospitals, also one for the use of the emergency department. And those, I think, were models that were uh, uh, had a significant impact uh, on the decisions that hospital management made in the month of March, maybe even into early April. At this point, our current work is to try to build uh, models to help support ongoing decision-making at the hospital begins reallocating some of the existing capacity back to pre-COVID bad use. Obviously, there's gonna need to be some of that, some capacity reserved within the hospital to take on potential surges in COVID cases. So that's what I wanted to say. Thank you very much. Thank you, Peter, for that insightful presentation. Now we have about 13 minutes for Q&A. Uh, our first question from the audience is from John Pang for Allison. So the question is, is there a trade-off between lowering WER for AAVE as compared to perhaps the alternative, identifying AAVE usage and having two models or a knob or a parameter for AAVE use for those participants? Sure, that's a great question. Um, I think one main thing to consider is that it'd be hard to identify a threshold cutoff for what qualifies to be a part of the AV model and what doesn't. Um, so specifically, AV isn't like a black or white thing. Um, you have a sliding scale of how many AV features one might speak with. Um, another thing to think about is that AV is spoken across the entirety of the US, um, but let's think about regional dialects. For example, Southern accents in the US share a lot of linguistic features phonologically with AV. So like how far down the rabbit hole do we wanna go? Would we want a separate model for each of the main regional dialects and also non-native English dialects? We know that men and women have different word error rates as well um, because men tend to speak with more disfluencies. So should, should genders also be separated out into different models? I don't know, but it seems difficult to scale. Um, the final note I'll say in response to this is that the magnitude of the discrepancy that we currently see is large enough that we should be able to get word error rates down just by using the same model, but um, feeding in more diverse training data. Um, but of course, even if training data are diverse, it's likely that you'll still have word error rates that are some degree different between different English varieties. Um, and depending on the magnitude of those differences, I think it'd be worth considering um, different models. Thank you, Allison. Our next question is from James Cross for Ashish. For budgeting, is a vote a lumped proxy for a benefit ROI or economic utility? Is there a plan for using AI to show social benefits as well as estimated costs? So, uh, uh, it is indeed a proxy for economic benefit, as the speaker currently asked. We are not yet in a position to use AI to show benefits and costs, primarily because, and this touches upon something that Peter uh, brought up, these models are heavily dependent on data, and to have an AI model inform what a user does or what a voter does in a voting context, you really have to have tremendous confidence in the model. What we can use AI for in a much to a much greater extent is how to interpret the results. So sometimes these processes are run as binding elections and sometimes they run as advisory to the city. When they run as advisory to the city, you can do very interesting analytics on how people vote. So for example, one thing you can do is you can look at people's votes after the fact 
and you can cluster them. And you can see what the majority is and what the minority is. But this is a very new notion of majority and minority because it's not a, again around demographics, but it's around uh, opinion. So you can get a minority cluster, which is a minority in its opinion, not in its demographics. And a majority cluster, which is a majority in its opinion, not in demographics. And this really can allow you to bring minority voices to the fore in a way that you couldn't if you just focus on demographics. So again, uh, in a lot of these elections, when it comes to elections, I think the right role of AI is often in interpreting the results, especially when the elections are not binding, but advisory. Uh, and you have to be careful putting a model in front of a voter in an election, because to do so, you really have to have tremendous confidence in the model. Thank you, Ashish. My next question is for Alan. Alan, we know that our algorithms can provide very powerful personalized solutions if we know highly private information about an individual. Do you think it's a good idea to make this trade-off transparent, specifically helping people understand how much extra value they get from an algorithm in exchange for giving up some privacy? Or do you think the trade-off transparency is not a good path to go down for the sake of societal sanity? Uh, well, in my personal opinion, I, I'm uh, far more, um, uh, I, I don't regard privacy as something that should be uh, traded in a market. Say, I'll give you a certain amount of money, you give me your privacy. Um, but um, I should, so, so yeah, in my opinion, um, uh, it, transparency does help if it's limited and it's in very specific situations. But I, the, the, um, the, the area that I was talking about in the talk was not so much um, taking uh, private information in order to uh, uh, target or do specific things that are useful for specific individuals, but rather aggregate analyses uh, which are of overall benefit, uh, um, and but the other point was that these are often done now um, without any uh, consent at all and without any knowledge uh, of the person. So they they not um, they are not informed that they are participating. They think that they're doing something completely different uh, 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 when they're using their apps and then giving up uh, participating in this uh, gray market for for data. And that I think is is certainly a com completely unacceptable. Um, but it's a it's a slightly more subtle question of of this this sort of um, do I can I pay you money and you give away your privacy and um, I think that's something that a lot of a, a, a big conversation needs to be had about that. <laughs> I personally feel it's not a, it's not a commodity in that sense. Sure. Thank you, Alan. Uh, my next question is for you, Peter. Peter, as you know, one of the problems I work on is demand forecasting for retail shopping. Now with COVID, we are seeing a regime shift in people's shopping behaviors. And so historical shopping patterns won't necessarily be good predictors of future demand for the products retailers might offer. What are your suggestions for making our models adapt and react quickly to this type of regime shift we are experiencing? It's a great question, and it's clear that uh, the post-COVID world will look different from the pre-COVID world in many different ways. Um, I think it's hard probably at this point to get a precise sense of exactly what those differences are going to look like. Uh, as an example, probably many of us don't really know at this point uh, what is going to be needed in order to make us comfortable in getting onto airplanes or going into uh, restaurants and, and the like. So, uh, you know, this is going to be a highly fluid, highly dynamic situation where, uh, you know, the uh, historical data that we have may not be particularly predictive of what happens in the future. And, uh, you know, we'll need to build uh, tools that uh, can work with less data, more uncertainty, and 
uh, recognize that in what businesses do that they need to factor in a significant amount of uh, uncertainty in terms of exactly how quickly the public will uh, become comfortable with uh, some of these uh, changes that will be necessary in the post COVID world and post COVID environment. So I think having very adaptive tools and sort of recognizing that there's gonna be a lot of post COVID uncertainty and, and not imagining that the decision tools will be as accurately predictive as they were in the pre COVID world. I think all of those things will be a necessary part of the uh, environment going forward. Thank you, thank you, Peter. My next question is for you, Alison, but uh, the rest of the speakers, please feel, for, feel free to chime in uh, because it's a general question of societal bias. So I am imagining a future world where algorithms will make decisions on things like approval for loans in hiring and perhaps also in criminal investigations what do you think we need to do as researchers in overcoming the biases these algorithms are likely to learn? Sure, that's a great question. Um, and I think one caveat to note is I don't think we'll ever fully overcome these biases, but we can do our best to chip away at them. Um, one thing that we would encourage is um, kind of what I was talking about at the end of my talk in terms of gathering more diverse training data. Uh, of course, this is hi a highly intensive process for ASRs, for example. You need to go out, you have to have your participants sign forms um, and allow the, uh, you to use their data. Um, you then have to process the data and hire um, linguists to transcribe everything by hand to make sure that you have good ground truth data. Um, and so this is all very long and laborious. And so um, getting companies um, and academics on board with doing these sorts of um, diverse data collection um, to use as training data is something that seems straightforward, but actually requires a lot more resources than I think um, might be intuitive. So that's one thing. And the other main thing I would suggest um, is kind of bringing these sorts of papers um, to light with the public. Um, so having some sort of public benchmark against which companies can compete against themselves uh, and show that year over year they are improving, um, they are doing better at recognizing av speech or other varieties of English or for facial recognition. Um, or for loans, uh, they have other benchmarks that they can use to show that um, year over year they are improving um, and lessening their bias in their systems. Thank you, Alison. Um, so thank you, um, all of you, Alison, Ash, and Peter, for your awesome presentations, answering these questions. So this ends our session on computational math for society. Bye.